Hi, this is Mrs. Swan. It's April 15th. We're still social distancing. I'm going to read to you a story today called Mrs. Harkness and the Panda. This is a true story of how the panda bear was brought to the United States. I think you're going to enjoy it. In 1934, Ruth Harkness had never seen a panda bear. Not many people in the world had. Pandas were shy and lived in the mountains of China. The terrain was so wild, so treacherous, that few explorers dared to risk it. But Mrs. Harkness knew one who was brave enough her husband. On September 22nd, 1934, William Harkness set off to bring the first live panda to the United States. Soon the whole world would know the panda. Mrs. Harkness wanted to go with him, but women were considered too dainty for exploring. Still, she hoped to join Mr. Harkness at the end of his expedition, an adventure together. Many months passed. Then, on a winter afternoon, Mrs. Harkness received terrible news. Her husband had died in China. Mrs. Harkness was very sad. She had loved him so. That love inspired her to carry on with his work. Mrs. Harkness would go to China. She would find the panda. I had inherited an expedition, she said. Mrs. Harkness lived in New York City. She designed tea gowns. She wasn't particularly strong, athletic, or daring. And except for her cats, Tibby and Baggy, she knew little about animals. But she did know that bringing back a panda would be hard, impossible even, one chance in a million, she said. Mrs. Harkness' friend scoffed. You're no explorer. You're out of your head. Don't forget, your husband died trying to find the panda. Mrs. Harkness didn't listen. She knew her husband had died trying to find the panda, and now she had an expedition to plan. On April 17, 1936, Mrs. Harkness set off on a steamer for China. Her ship sailed the Red Sea through ports in Sri Lanka and Singapore, and then finally China. Mrs. Harkness arrived in Hong Kong with its hidden coves and rocky islands and a harbor above with sailboats called junks. When a little girl waved three times to Mrs. Three times, Mrs. Harkness took it as a sign of good luck. Her next stop was Shanghai, where she met a friend of her husband's. He scoffed. You can't climb mountains. You'll get sick. You'll run into bandits. You'll never make it out alive. But Mrs. Harkness didn't listen. She had an expedition to plan. Finally, she met one person who didn't think she was crazy. He was a dashing young man named Yang D. Lin, or as he was called in English, Quentin Young. Quentin knew the bamboo forests. He had seen pandas. He decided to help Mrs. Harkness. First, she had to have the right clothes. 
explorer's clothes. A tailor cut Mr. Harkness's clothes to fit Mrs. Harkness. A fur-hooded parker, woolen underwear, riding trousers, slacks, shirt, and an old tweed jacket. Next, a shoemaker cobbled down a pair of Mr. Harkness's bulky boots to fit Mrs. Harkness's little feet. They probably had two pounds of nails apiece, declared Mrs. Harkness. Then she and Quentin packed and packed and packed. They packed maps and sleeping bags, medicine and rope, wire and flea powder, they packed guns for protection. Mrs. Harkness even packed a bottle of dried milk, just in case the panda was a baby. They packed 22 pieces of luggage. Late at night on September 26th, Mrs. Harkness and Quentin set off to find their panda. They sailed two weeks up the Golden Yangtze River. They reached Chungking and then drove 300 miles past rice paddies and water buffalo and tiny hillsides. farms to Cheng Du. Mrs. Harkness hired a jolly, fat cook named Wang. She hired 16 men to carry the 22 pieces of luggage. She kept on moving. Although not always on her own two feet. Sometimes Mrs. Harkness rode on a contraption called a Wa Gar. But she did some walking. When the heavy boots blistered her feet, she traded them for rope sandals like the ones the Chinese men wore. The journey was rough. Mrs. Harkness almost cried. Still, she didn't turn back. She had an expedition to finish. Near a ruined Buddhist temple, the expedition met an old man with wild gray hair and no teeth named Lao Tsang. He told Mrs. Harkness and Quentin that he knew where to find Bei Sheng, the Chinese word for panda. He would take them there. And one day they climbed, scrambled, and stumbled for ne nearly 30 miles. They pitched camp high in the mountains. The men set traps to capture the panda alive. They found panda droppings, but no pandas. They discovered bamboo stalks that pandas had crunched, but no pandas. They saw clarmox on trees, but no pandas. On November 9, 1936, Mrs. Harkness and Quentin Ka and Lao Tsang climbed a thousand feet in snow to see if any pandas had wandered into their traps. None. Mrs. Harkness cursed the wet bamboo and s that soaked her. Then up ahead she heard a shout. What is it? she asked Quentin. Bei Sheng, he said. Mrs. Harkness struggled after Quentin through the damp branches. Quentin stopped at an old dead tree. From the tree came a whimper. Mwah! A baby panda. Quentin tucked the baby in his shirt 
and he and Mrs. Harkness slid and staggered back to camp. Good thing Mrs. Harkness had packed that baby bottle. Mrs. Harkness named the wiggly furry bundle Sue Lynn. It means a little bit of something very cute. Mrs. Harkness had accomplished her husband's mission, their mission. She hastened to return to America, but first she had two very important things to do. She scattered her husband's ashes in the Chinese mountains, and she thanked Quentin, her guide and friend, who had made the dangerous but exhilarating expedition possible. She gave him a carved gold ring to give to his fiance. It was her wedding band. News of Sue Lynn spread fast. When Mrs. Harkness arrived in America with the panda in her arms, reporters were waiting. Pandemonium, roared the headlines. None of the newspaper stories called Mrs. Harkness crazy or foolish or reckless. They called her a woman explorer. Mrs. Harkness found Sue Lynn a home away from home in the Brookfield Zoo, just outside Chicago. Scientists rushed to study the cub, and everyone came to see it. No animal had ever received so much attention. Now the whole world knew the panda. Mrs. Harkness, too, found a home away from home. in the rugged, beautiful mountains of faraway China. There's an actual picture of Mrs. Harkness and a panda. I do not believe it is Su Lin. So the story ends with a timeline of Mrs. Harkness's life. And there's also an author's note. So I wanna read some of the author's note to you. Um, those patched eyes, that roly-poly body, that bold black and white fur. Who doesn't love a panda? Thanks to Ru thank Ru Ruth Harkness for that. Of course, today we might question whether it was right to take a baby panda from the wild. Our attitudes about animal conservation and zoos, as well as our knowledge of pandas' behavior, are much different than they were in the 1930s. Back then, before the advent of television and widespread commercial air travel, zoos were the primary way for people, including scientists, to learn about and appreciate animals, particularly rare or unusual species. But even today, many conservatists admire Mrs. Har Harkness's contribution to zoology. In bringing Sue Lin to America, Harkness introduced the world to a tubby bamboo chomping ambassador. After Su Lin, the race to kill pandas for sport eventually lost much of its appeal. Instead, people rooted for their survival. Meanwhile, scientists who once doubted that bears that the bears existed, they were considered mythical beasts like unicorns in China, began to study their biological behavior. There's more to that author's note, but I'm gonna let you come to the library and check this book out. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it. <laughs>